and expressed something that made me feel good, made me want to respond. And that was uh, that the members of the community, advice by elders was that uh, while it's easy for Indian people in this modern time to want to embrace anything Indian, and certainly the pan-Indian or inter-tribal powwow way is, uh, is something that I think you go around the country, there, there are some constants in this powwow way that we can kind of connect with the drum and the circle and the, the dance styles and, and the spirit that's associated with that. But many of the songs and the dance styles are copied from some of the uh, Northern Plains or Ojibwe or others. And some of our old dances and dance styles are not necessarily a part of that powwow. But in an effort to hold on to something Indian, and that's what so many of us do. We powwow a lot in Oklahoma. And I go every chance I can. But the unique thing about our culture, uh, the Lenape culture in particular, and I have to perhaps qualify myself first by saying I, I am a Lenape, I am a Lenape uh, descendancy, not an antidote. When I was visiting with Karen, I, I finally put it together in my mind when the name Nanticoke, any Lenape Indians in New Jersey, I was trying to put Nanticoke and Lenape together, but this community has put it together through marriage and living together as a community over the generations. And so that's what it represents, that collective. And uh, so I can only speak to you uh, that little bit of Lenape culture that I've learned in just a few short years that I've been a student. Mark asked me to come here and share with you many of the things that there is no, uh, I don't know how to say it, there, there, there is no lock and key put on this information. Uh, as I expressed earlier, I am not here to conduct medicine man rituals, or to uh, hold sacred ceremonies and uh, that kind of thing. I am not authorized, ordained, or given permission to do those kinds of things. Nor would I dare do that. I must further qualify myself by saying that although I may have some experience and capability of standing before you and sharing with you, you know, what little I know, I have to emphasize what little I know. Because when it comes to these ways, the ways of our ancestors, when we think about how much was lost, forgotten, put away, and the fact that I have only been a student of my culture for about 17 years now. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm like Lark over here. I'm like a child. There's far more that I don't know than everything that's ever been compacted into my brain over the last 17 years. There's far more that I don't know. And because of that, you know, it, it, keeps, it keeps feeding that, that, that hunger. And it keeps me wanting to stay on that path. It's really easy to get diverted on matters of, of, of politics and uh, uh, your community development and money and recognition and all of this kind of stuff. But if you don't spend some time, as you all well know, if you don't spend some time being in that circle, if you don't spend some time feeling that drumbeat resonate right in your heart, it's, you can't be grounded. you got to have both. Like I always say, uh, we as Indian people, we have a, we have a, a, we have a, a dual identity. We have that legal and political status. Sure we do. That's what gives us the right to have autonomy over our own communities and that sort of thing. But we are a cultural and an ethnic people. And it is our culture and a very specific part of our culture that we as Lenape people, our language, 
that makes us unique and different from everyone else in the world. And to me, the combination of that legal and political identity and the ethnic and the cultural identity, it all boils down to one phrase that I like to use. You're not an Indian community, you're not an Indian tribe or anything. If you don't have two things, language and land. Language is the foundation of all culture. Everything, when we learn about these songs, when we learn about using language and prayer ceremony, just everyday life exchange, there's a spirit in that language. It's what, it's what brings it all to life. Whenever we make our clothes, our moccasins, tie a drum, all of these things, there's a word that's given. And when you, when you use these words, like our ancestors used, you're, you're reviving a spirit. Because I truly believe, you know, our ancestors, they didn't know English. They, they, knew, they knew that tongue. They knew that, that Lenape. Or other variations of that Algonquin stock language. And they say, you know, when we pray to the Creator, Keshevamukam, the Creator, we use our Indian language. Those old timers, they tell me that those prayers are given kind of a special, special power. And whether your prayers rise with the smoke from tobacco or cedar or sage or whatever. And those prayers rise like that in our language. You know, the Creator, they say, hears those words, smells that cedar, knows this Lenape children are down there praying, asking for help. The Creator's going to look down and take care of us like that. That's what those old folks back home in Oklahoma tell me. I believe it. And uh, why why is it important? Well, yeah, language is language is unique. But why is it important if we don't use it? What what real good does it do to to learn? And my answer is this. You know, our, our, our ancestors, whether those that remained here in Oklahoma, or, I'm sorry, remained here in uh, New Jersey, or those that went on to Oklahoma or Canada, think about the times since the first European contact. Think about the despair that they went through um, with having their communities torn apart, with having another, another culture of people whole different kind of people come forward and come in such strength and in such numbers that it overwhelms our way. And the only way to stay alive is to adapt. The only way to stay alive is to learn other ways and bring on new ways. And when we do that, we give up a little bit of the old. Well, when that started happening with the language, it was a combination of we let it happen, which was our fault, or we were forced to give up our language, which is some other person's fault. But either way, when we let those kind of things go, we dishonor those ancestors who spent so much time holding on. We dishonor the memory of our ancestors who we went through far more suffering than you or I ever did. I mean, yes, we've experienced discrimination in some of these communities. Might be subtle, might be kind of overt. But I have yet to see the United States Army drive into Bridgeton, New Jersey, and with bayonets run you out of your homes. I have yet to see them punish you and slap you 
if you spoke the Indian language or run you out of town. My gosh, nowadays, they give us federal grants to go back and recapture our language. And it was just 100 years ago, certainly in the boarding schools in Oklahoma, that they were slapping you and punishing you for speaking the language. It's amazing, the turn of events. But if we do not embrace the foundations of identity, and that is language and land, and we hold strong to our language, and we hold on to what land we have, and we try to gain more land to have stewardship over. I don't want to get into a big debate about ownership of land. As we know, we don't know it. We just take care of it on behalf of the Creator. But if, if we let those things go, well, what about the, what the ancestors did? All those generations, the suffering and, and having to be picked up and moved out of your community and sent further west or go up to Canada, here or there, you can't be in your home anymore. Or your ancestors who had to kind of disappear into the woods, disappear into thin air, put on another guise to stay alive. If in our generation we don't take a little bit of time out of our lives and spend a little bit of time trying to help out our people recapture language and land, then we dishonor our own ancestors who we claim our bloodline through, who we claim our current contemporary identity through. So that's why this is important. It's more than just it would be nice if we could keep these things alive. We have a sacred obligation to our ancestors. That's certainly a belief of mine. My bloodline and my Indianness, that was an accident of birth. I had no choice. I had no choice as to who I was when I was born. It was given to me. But like I said, I'm going to try to think back to those ancestors and when I, when I go and listen to stories or do research and see about my own ancestors with those Delaware names, those Lenape names. I think about what they went through. And that's why when they worked hard and at times even went underground, had to go out and hide to, to do their dances or had to, had to hide out in a home to talk the language because they were afraid if the community were to talk in India, they would be further discriminated against. Now, we can lay it out on a table and say, let's all join hands together. And America, in some pockets of America, is applauding this effort. We like to see you Indian people keeping your languages alive. I know there are a few rednecks in Oklahoma who are introducing an English-only bill in the state legislature. But, notwithstanding that, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I'm proud to be a Lenape. And if I'm going to show that pride, it's going to be more than just carrying a card in my pocket. And it's all right. It's all right to have that membership card. It's all right to have something that documents who you are. But to be honest with you, that's the white man's criteria. A piece of paper that says who you are. When your own community can say, I know who your grandmother was. When your own community elders can talk to you in your language and you can talk right back. You know, that to me, and you can show by your actions in the community that you've got the heart of, of the people. You know, that's, that, in my opinion, really confirms your identity. And that's why I've been very anxious to come here to bridge to uh, Periton. Is that where I am right now? Uh, and but to this area and to learn more about this community to see what you all hold dear as far as language and land. Mark did ask me if I would share with you all then our social dances. So uh, before I get into specifics on language and some of all of the stuff that I brought, uh, the way I see our program Okay.
Yeah. I'm the light's sitting at clock, I can't. It's 5.15, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about language. I don't, I don't want this to be a real dry college-type lecture. Uh, I want to be able to talk with, not talk at you all. And I want to explain some of these things as we go along. But I will talk about language in the context of, of uh, our dances and uh, our culture. Then a little later, um, tonight, I want to learn, uh, or I wanted to help teach and have you all learn two types of dances tonight. And that will be the lead, or otherwise known as stomp dance. And then the other will be uh, the bean dance. Uh, so as I've spoken with Mark, we have some singers that we've identified, and you all have been identified as singers who will take the responsibility of learning uh, these songs. And we'll get a start to it. But just like I've learned, uh, we have recordings which I brought from Delaware singers in the 1960s and 70s. They were old timers then. And I've got practice tapes now uh, with these songs on here. We're going to learn these songs. Again, tonight, the lead dance and the bean dance. Tomorrow night, it'll be the woman dance and go get them dance. Now, these will be social dances, purely for fun. They're for fun, amusement, and entertainment, usually held between the spring and the autumn. So we're, you know, coming in the tail end of summer, but um, even through uh, the autumn season before that first freeze ever hits. In October, uh, the Lenapes had their King Greek Town, or the Big House Church. Uh, it was a 12-day ceremony in October. Now that would indeed was religious in nature. That was their uh, ceremony of spiritual renewal for the community. But in addition to that, in, in addition to those religious ceremonies, I mean, the Delawares got together and just had fun. You know, I mean, we didn't have a video store, right, to, to go down to for Saturday Night Entertainment. So they got together and just had good, old, fun dances, fun songs. And that's what I'm bringing to your community here this weekend, is just these fun songs. And we can learn them and enjoy them. I want you to keep them and keep them in a good way. Enjoy yourselves like that. And in the future, there will be other opportunities to learn more, more songs, more dances. And then we start perhaps at another time, another weekend. We can discuss and delve into the realm of, of the more spiritual aspects of, uh, of the Lenape, the old big house religion. Nonetheless, this weekend is here to have a good time. Um, so we'll do that because generally the the, uh, the dances were held in the evening, generally after the sun went down or as the sun was going down. And so we're going to do that tonight. And I think what we'll do is after a couple of learning sessions, we'll just take it outside, go around a couple times. So uh, and throughout the weekend, because it, it is a short term, very intensive session. I don't expect us to learn every word of every song, memorize it, and after a one-hour lesson, you're out here, you're leading the bean dance or the woman dance. That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen with me, even at home. But what we can do is we can work with these practice tapes. Um, for instance, on the bean dance, I've got, I've got the words written out. And our singers, we can follow along. We can learn some of these songs. We'll learn the dance that's associated with the songs. And we'll go out and do it. That's the best way to learn it, is just go out and do it. Uh, throughout the weekend, I have some, uh, I have a few items that I brought with me or I had sent up here. Headquarters in Barbersville. Um, 
This is a two tape, two cassette tape language set with a booklet from Touching Leaves Indian Press. Touching Leaves was Nora Dean, Nora Thompson. Uh, she was married to Charlie Dean. Touching Leaves Woman was uh, one of our full blood uh, elders. Did, did Nora ever come back? This, yes. She yes. did come back here. Yes. Okay, good. And so these are the language tapes that have been out of the animal market quite a long time. Uh, some new items. Small dictionary called Conversational Lenape. On the front end, it's English to Lenape translations. Uh, the number one, Quinty. Uh, pepper. Pepper. Raccoon, Nahanin. So then the second half of the book flips it around and goes from Lenape to English. And uh, also has a little pronunciation key in there. So uh, I wanted to uh, let you know I think we have 15 copies available here. This one I'm particularly proud of because as recently as uh, four years ago, uh, when I was the chief, I introduced the internet to the Delaware tribe. And at first, a lot of the folks there felt that computers, the fact that the tribe had a computer, and now I was trying to bring on internet, was some sort of a electronic luxury that cost way too much money, and we had no business dealing with that. I had one of our tribal members that felt like the internet was a communist plot for the government to get into your computer and therefore into your mind and they were going to be able to access everything you do and control you or something on us. You know, I think we've understood that while the internet and computers, uh, maybe they do have some their own weird sort of identity, uh, they can be powerful teaching tools and communication tools and we're learning and discovering that. And so we took a, an example that the Miami tribe had engaged in and developed a Lenape version of it. A CD-ROM, it's a teaching tool, and it has uh, some games, and uh, uh, there's a pronunciation, uh, there's a word list, and then there's some games. Kids love this stuff. Point and click. Every time you click on an image of a turtle or a raccoon or a, or a canoe or whatever, pair of moccasins, you can hear a little voice coming, you know, out of the speaker on your computer, telling you what that word is. And then you have a match game, kind of like it looks like a checkerboard here. You can click one little square, and up pops, let's say the turtle. And then you try to find another one of the squares and find the match. Click over here, I'll bet you it matches on here. All of a sudden, you got, uh, like I said, a canoe. Well, those two don't match, and you keep searching around until you find the match. And it's a lot of fun, and the kids really love it. So, brand new technology to learn about our ancient language. Now, uh, one other thing that is, of course, particularly the Nazi that's related to the songs, and that is uh, we have two different uh, music tapes. We have uh, Songs of the Lenape, or Delaware Indians, Volume 1 and Volume 2. So I have a, just a few copies here available for sale over the weekend. And I'll be glad to get with you as you, as you wish. Uh, we can make more available, ship more over here at another time. I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about some some books that are not directly associated with the uh, this teaching endeavor, but they are out there. One is called Always a People. I don't I didn't send the book. Uh, they're actually it's actually published by Indiana University Press. This little postcard here, you can actually see the cover, 
uh, and uh, it is, here's the order of the information here. Always a People it was published in 1998, I think, 97, by Indiana University Press. It's Oral Histories of Contemporary Woodland Indians. 41 individuals representing 11 nations tell their stories, and it's tribal leaders uh, and elders from the Woodland Indian tribes. So you've got Delaware, Shawnee, Miami, Potawatomi, uh, Wyandotte, you know, like that. And uh, so there's ordering information. If you wanted to order a copy uh, for your own library, the other books that I have brought, now this is a copy to uh, review if you wanted to buy a set for your school or your kids or whatever. This is really geared along the lines of about, uh, I'd say, nine and ten year olds. It's a four part series called, uh, it's the, uh, uh, well, it's, it's the Woodland Adventure series, and there are four stories here that cover the four seasons. Spring planting, celebrating summer, the fall gathering, and winter story time. They are woodland based uh, stories uh, that teach kids everything from counting to um, learning how to make a garden, what kind of plants, uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, food is grown, how it's grown, the time of the year, uh, what it produces, but it's a, it also teaches them just how to read. And then it has some useful information in the back about woodland cultures. Uh, celebrating Summer, it's another counting story that shows about building an arbor and getting ready to have the summer powwow. So, for instance, uh, two dancers to set up the drummer's chairs, like that, you know, it, teaches, it just teaches them how to count. Uh, the fall gathering, uh, how appropriate, once again, the celebrating of the harvest. All of these illustrations are done by native artists, and uh, again, it's a counting story. Three choices of nuts, four types of squash, etc., etc., that kind of thing. And finally, the winter storytelling is a particularly Delaware or Lenape story. Uh, and the, the artwork uh, tells the story of a young Delaware boy, and it teaches how to make a, a little game, a little, a little toy that was popular among Delaware kids. Kokalesh, uh, and uh, it teaches, it tells in the story how it's made in the old times, and then gives instructions on how to make one today. Um, and this one, like I said, is, is particularly Delaware in its, in its style and its look. So I have ordering information about this too. You can look at these review copies if you're interested. You can send off uh, to the uh, Indiana University School of Journalism and order as many of these books as you would like. So that will be available throughout the weekend. Now, uh, I guess before I go on any further, I, I certainly want to uh, tell you all how pleased I am to be here, how much I appreciate your hospitality. And uh, so what I wanted to do was uh, I brought some tobacco to use in whatever way you want to use it, whether, you know, ceremonially or uh, if you use tobacco, like when you're preparing a fire or, you know, preparing smoke, you know, for prayer or whatever. So I brought this here. So you got someone who wants to accept this. Luke, I'll just give that to you and just say, Lanishi, thank you for, uh, uh, again, for inviting me up here. <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of uh, trying to break down our language from a linguist standpoint, 
uh, a lot of our Indian languages they, they have done. They, they, they create these headings, Suin or Iroquoian or Algonquin or, you know, like that. And of course, the Lenape language is uh, derived from that Algonquin stock of, of languages. But uh, in Oklahoma, I guess, being Southern folks, uh, we have that, that Unami dialect. Uh, and that appears to be what was retained by the native speakers uh, as they uh, took their westward trek over the years uh, to come ultimately to Oklahoma. And when I go up to Canada and I hear them talk, they have more of a Muncie dialect up there. Um, I cannot, again, express enough how I really believe that that language has, has a spirit to it. And that's why when we learn these words, I always try to just, I try to say every word with, with pride. And to be, sometimes I'm a little too careful and precise, therefore I can't be real fluid in my delivery because I want to make sure, because you got to be careful. Um, uh, what you say and how you say it because the slightest little uh, inflection um, uh, well the slightest little inf inflection could make a big difference for instance excuse me for just a moment while I try to find something here I wanted to show you a or share with you Okay, for instance, the word we found me, we found me, it means eat with me. You've got to be careful that you don't say we bang me, which means sleep with me. <laughs> so you gotta, you got to be careful in your delivery and be precise <laughs> because if, if you don't know, of course, nowadays, very few, except for maybe some of those elders, are going to, they're going to know that difference, yeah. but, you know, you'd hate to be saying your prayer at night and think you're saying one thing and those ancestors are gone. <laughs> huh? What'd you say? <laughs> so, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to always be a, a lifelong answer for me. Another thing about, what is the context of language in the community? When I was the chief, uh, I heard one of our tribal politicians say, you young people, you need to learn this language. You need to learn this language. Keep it going in your generation. You want to give it that stern admonition. You need to do this. I watched and I listened and I thought. Now, if I was a 16-year-old, I had some adult telling me, you need to learn the language. I think, why? In what context am I going to use it? My parents don't speak it at home. You guys don't speak it at the tribal council meeting. Uh, you're, you're, you're giving me a responsibility and making me responsible for something, and I don't even know why I'm responsible for that. That's why I started coming up with this philosophy of, of honoring the ancestors and and showing how much we respect the gift of culture and language and that gift of heritage that was passed down by, again, those who suffered a heck of a lot more than we ever did. But uh, one of the things, one of the things too I was thinking about a young person is, uh, where am I going to use this? In what context am I going to use this? And I looked to my community, and they could not provide an answer. Other than, you should do it because they practically failed in their generation. And they see it as, oh my God, if this next generation doesn't do it for us, it will be lost. And then you got some who say, 
I'm not going to teach you mixed bloods. It's going to die with me. I'll be the last great Delaware in history. To me, that insults the ancestors. If you don't share it, you know, again, that bloodline, that's not the fault of that 16-year-old boy or girl. Their bloodline, their identity, that's not their fault. Why punish them? If they're willing to step forward and learn, you can't say, we need to learn this language. You go in that room and you learn this. Our language is going to die out if you don't learn this. My goodness, that's harsh on a young person to bear that responsibility all of a sudden. Instead, we should take our young ones by the hand and say, let me show you why it's important. And how are you going to show them? You've got to create community activities where language is spoken. What's the easiest things? Dance and food. And so we have uh, back in our community uh, what we call our Fourth Monday. Fourth Monday is a uh, anybody in the tribe that wants to get together, we get together in a room like this, pull some tables together, have a potluck supper. After we eat, we go outside, we practice the bee dance, the lead dance, the woman dance, the go-getting dance. We practice singing songs, we practice the dance steps, and we practice that flow in the circle, and that flow of learning, that learning circle. And that's how we keep that energy going. And so when we started getting together, I thought, well, let's learn some words. And so I just got, a, I got one of those big marker boards, you know, with those, with those markers. I would uh, say, okay, it's supper time. Let's take, let's take 10 words around food. Salapon, fry bread. Uh, Cuppy, coffee, apple, uh, whatever. Uh, sea kai, salt. And just, just little things that are going to be around the table. I'm hungry. Katupwe, uh, I'm hungry. Katusumwe, I'm thirsty. Just some phrases that are going to be practical usage of the language. Um, and if you can learn these little phrases, then I, what I told everyone is, okay, I've written these ten phrases on this board. Here's the English, here's the Lenape. Now, before we go through the food line, for the next ten minutes, I don't want you to speak any English. Don't speak any English. Even if you have to laugh and giggle your way through some of these words. Learn and use it in the context. Sit across the table from each other and say, Got to do it. Got to my mates. I'm hungry. I want some food. Bring me some food. You know, like that. Yes, sir. Can you say give me your wallet? Sir? Can you say give me your wallet? Ah. Uh. <laughs> I got all kinds of phrases, but uh, I'm going to keep it. Good. Actually, some of the first phrases I ever learned from an elder was uh, phrases to show how much you appreciate a fine-looking woman. And, uh, but I won't be teaching those this week. Uh, but in the context of how to, how to learn the language, I mean, you got to make it fun. You know, not tie yourself to the desk and stick your nose in that book and Break it all into your brain, you know, because it might die out with you. <laughs> you know, oh, what a terrible responsibility. Oh my God, if I don't learn this language, my people are going to die and they're going to point to me in history as the one who let it go. That's, a, that's not fair to anybody. Anybody. And uh, so, it met with some mixed results. But I found that to be kind of easy as far as a context. Remember, 
It's one thing to sit here and look at a dictionary and to memorize a word. But unless you reinforce it all the time, just like anything, you're going to kind of forget. And you're going to need some kind of reminder. And then what do you end up doing? You end up being a parish. Listen to the tape. I can repeat it. I can remember what the tape said. But can you speak Lenape? Yeah. And then you step over here and you start repeating what you heard on the tape. And you sound like a talking dictionary. That, that's archiving. And archiving is important. But archiving is... Archiving is this. this. It doesn't stop when it reaches this point. This is important. The work that was done here was extremely important. The words are on tape. The words are in a book. So they're there. And they have a long shelf life now. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff has already graced three generations since they first came out. But what happens if all you do is you buy this and you put it up on your shelf at home and you say, I've got the Delaware language. But it's up here. It's not, it's not here. It's not coming out. And the life, the spirit that's in here it gets all closed up in this little bag, like that. So it's context. And language, let's think about communication. When you speak a word, I have to speak to you. You acknowledge and you speak back to me. That's conversation. And the only way to keep this language really alive is to put it in a context where it is conversed, where I say something to you in Lenape, and you respond back in Lenape. That's when it really starts gaining some life. And so why not do it in simple context? And that's what I hope that we can do this weekend. A few phrases about food, about the supper table, a few phrases of kinship and greeting, and a few phrases centered around our dances. And if you can just get a little start this weekend, I mean, all we're going to do is we're just going to barely scratch the surface because we have a little bit of time and we've got a very full program as it is. But if we can just get it started and get used to the idea that you just take it in little bits and pieces, then a week, a month from now, or whenever you have a next community meeting, you want to have a little hot love supper, do that. And I'd like to suggest the way I introduce some words about food. Just put it up on a board and take some time. Instead of saying, fry bread, say, salad pom. You know, just get used to doing that. And I guarantee you, the more and more you do, then you're going to find yourself out there somewhere, you'll be at a restaurant. You'll say, sikai, pepper. You know, instead of salt and pepper. Um, or apcon for bread. Now, you'll freak out the waitress if you say that. But I mean, if you're talking to your own family member and you start using that, not only do you kind of bring it to life a little bit, but, you know, when you can really start speaking some words in your language, what a, what a boost to your sense of, of pride and heritage. And that's why, before I ever got started on the political trail and politics and government within the tribe, I had to, as a young adult man, come back and go to elders and say, first, I want to get reintroduced back into my community. I didn't grow up in the community that my dad grew up in. And so, as an adult, after I got out of the military, I came back. And I didn't have a grandparent and a parent to teach me these things. I had to seek out those few remaining ones, reintroduce myself, qualify myself as to who, who I descended from, just to get them to say, okay, well, come on in, sit down, you know, have something to eat, let's talk. And then finally, to be given permission to be taught these things. And I've got a long ways to go. But I'm finding out if you just give it some simple context and something that's easy to master, you get that under your belt, so to speak, then you can take off. But, uh, but
but to me, to me the most important use of our language is in our prayers. I keep saying, what the elders told me, the power of your prayer is so much more enhanced if you say your prayers in the traditional language of the ancestors. Because all of this stuff was a gift. The Creator gave our language, our songs, our dances, our, our ways, all of these ways in our understanding. Gave it, the Creator gave it to specifically to our Lenape people or specifically to the Nantico people. That as a special gift and said this is unique from all those other people. The Sioux people, the Athabasca people up there in northern Canada and Alaska, the Pueblo people of New Mexico. Wherever they are, they've got their own language and it's special to them. But you and Alpha people, you have a language all to yourselves. And what a what a powerful gift. And 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 when you learn to use that right, you bring out that spiritual power. Now one aspect alone doesn't do it. One word, one dictionary or something doesn't do it. You've got to put it in context. I go back to that word context. Using the language in a setting so that that power can come out. Now to, again, this weekend, we're not going to get too deeply into the power of the Spirit in religion and ceremony. But nonetheless, power still does reside and resonate in even our social endeavors, in even our dance, even talking about food or kinship. And that's that's what I'm suggesting to you all. And take that responsibility. Now, I'm, I'm going to also admonish myself. Whenever I give speeches, I always tell uh, other people to Turn off your beepers and your pagers and your cell phones. You know, and then, that was mine. <laughs> so I've got to put it on uh, silent. And my apologies. You better hurry up and call it back. It's probably my daughter. She's getting married next weekend, so she's, she's running around. Yeah, trying to get all the arrangements made. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah, the context of language, and and to say yes, young people, you should learn the language. And kids pick it up so much easier. The kids, they love the CD ROM. I mean, they just zip. Right around, they had a lot of fun. Um, and the, you know, the younger you are, you, you just have this. Your mind is cluttered with so many other things, or restrictions aren't put on your on your mind that you develop over the years when you're a young one like that. So, yeah, we want these young ones to pick up some of these fun words that have to do with food and kinship and dance. But we should hold them by the hand and say, let's learn it together. So that when you learn it, you can talk to me. And I'm going to talk back to you. And we'll share that. It creates a stronger bond between the generations, between brothers and sisters of the community, and that spiritual bond that you have with the ancestors that carry that language on in their generation and pass it down like you will too, like we do that. Uh, classes. Community classes. You all really, I would encourage you to find a way of designing your own. Um, do not think that we have really got it going back home. <laughs> because when we have language class, sometimes it's as little as four or five people. Sometimes on a really good day, 15, 18, which is a pretty good class. Um, sometimes we can't get it. We just have to cancel it that night because we don't have enough teachers. But we get together and we spend time 
just picking phrases, uh, picking types of words or a certain context. Again, let's say tonight we're going to learn songs that are related to food. Tomorrow night we're going to learn songs that are related to kinship terms, etc., etc. You've got enough here with this kind of material to develop your own lesson plan. Take it slowly. Learn a few words at a time. Develop a context. And again, by developing a context, I mean put on the supper, put on the dance, have a gathering, and ask for 10 minutes of that afternoon or evening that you just sit down and visit, that you walk over to a relative or a community member on the other side of the room and sit down and just greet them in Lenape. Shake hands with them. Call them Niti's friend. Nachans, older brother, whatever. And get used to doing that and reinforce it. And then next week or several weeks down the road when you get back together again, refresh your memory, add a few more words. And just take the easy ones and use them all the time. <laughs> take the easy ones and just use them all the time. And uh, after a while, it'll really start, it'll really start taking and again, it's a wonderful source of, of pride of your heritage when you can say these words. Um, later, later on, uh, uh, when we get into the teaching, we're going to, uh, uh, as I said, learn uh, about uh, a couple of uh, a couple of dances here. Been to Oklahoma or have seen the, the stomp dance? Okay, so many of you all know about that. Um, what, I've, what I've done is, uh, I, we're, we're going to learn some lead, lead dance songs. So that means the men, particularly men singers who have been assigned this responsibility, uh, will pick up on some, on some songs. I will leave you with some audio tapes. I have, uh, I have two tapes here with four different dances. On this tape, side one, I have Nikanka, the leader of the stomp dance. On side two, I have Malaksitka, the bean dance. Tomorrow night, we'll be learning Skweyuk Nakumaya, or the woman dance, and Nahanaiti, which is the go get a dance. A lot of fun. And we'll be learning that. Now, tomorrow's dances will feature the use of the water drum. And we're going to have a much longer session throughout the day to learn about tying the water drum and using that drum uh, for the woman dance and the go get dance. Tonight's dances, however, uh, require a rattle. They say that the Creator gave our Indian people three musical instruments to use in ceremony. The whistle, which could be anything from a simple reed that creates a little whistle noise to these beautiful Indian flutes made out of cedar or whatever. Um, uh, river cane flutes, any kind of a, of a tube or reed type of, of uh, instrument that you blow air through and passes through a chamber and creates that little whistling noise. All kinds of variations. I've got a, at home a whistle made out of a wing bone, of an eagle wing. Um, then there was the rattle. So many different forms of rattles. Of course, this one being turtle shell. Or the gourd rattle. Deer toes. So, that's another ancient instrument. And then, of course, finally is the drum. And we all know about the drum. And then, in the context of the songs we're going to be doing, we're going to learn uh, the water drum. And it can be, I think, uh, Harry, you remember when we were up in Canada, uh, those singers up there, they made a wood water drum. 
um, what I have, which we used back in Oklahoma, is the iron kettle with a deer hide stretched over the top, filled with water, and that hide is wet. And when it's tied just right, it creates a real strong and resonant sound. And we'll be uh, using that tomorrow in, in those songs. In the lead dance, uh, as some of you know, and the rest of you all will find out, you, of course we all we dance in a circle. And the lead dance will have a male singer who will start off by having the introduction to the song, the first calling to bring the dancers in line, and they dance in a single file. But when they start going into a circle, it kind of turns into a, a I don't know, I call it a corkscrew, because you, you, you start out, you start out like this, and it just keeps getting, just kind of creates a circle, bigger and bigger, and the ones on the end, you're dancing too fast in the front end. Man, hey here. We're just going to have to fight the heat. Well, I'm sorry, I, I should have spoken into the microphone a little bit more. All right. if, if it does hit you more, I'm not, I'm going. But um, I only have one set of cans. Talk about adaptation here. I'm going to digress for just a moment and talk about, about the use of these rattles. You know, adaptation, when Indians face some sort of adversity, some sort of change, in order to remain alive, they adapted. Uh, or in some cases, they found something that was better than, or different, and they really liked it from what they were used to. I mean, think about it. When the Europeans first brought over trade cloth and ribbon, wow, those Indian women who spent so much time working with animal hides and tanning them, cutting them, all of that preparation spending so much time doing bead work or quill work or some kind of, all of a sudden, you don't have to go out and get dyes from berries or walnuts or something. Oh my God, look at the beautiful colors on these, on these textiles that these foreigners have brought. That beautiful ribbon. And these Indian women, they sure learn quick how to make gorgeous dresses, ribbon work patterns and that. How about those first rattles that were used in our ceremonies. Our old friend the turtle. But what happened when Indian people about a hundred years ago, in many cases, did not even have access to go out along the stream and find that little box turtle anymore. And so they learn to adapt. Nowadays, there are more shell shakers. And they're called shell shakers because in the old days, they had a set of these. But instead of these cans, they were these, well, actually, maybe a little bit smaller than these. But they had these turtle shells. And the women, We'll dance with these things wrapped around their legs, like this. And so that when they dance behind the man, they create the rhythm. What a powerful, powerful feeling that I think that a woman must have when she can shake shells. And in unison with the lead singer, and say you have 30 or 40 shell shakers out there. And you have 60 or 80 people going around in a circle like that. What power? What power? That's what the Creator gave them. To empower ourselves. To make us feel good. All of these things. Those cans or turtle shell rattles alone have a certain kind of power and spirit inside them. The use of our language as expressed through those songs. 
in and of itself and by itself has a certain kind of power. The use of our language in prayer before we ever start that dance. Or when we're singing that song in the traditional language, in and of itself has a special kind of power. But you know what? It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You know what I'm talking about with a jigsaw puzzle? If you take a box, if you go to the store and you buy a jigsaw puzzle and you take that box out, and you dump the box upside down on the table, you start looking around. You can look at that one piece. And you can look at it enough and say, yeah, I, I know where that goes. That, that one piece, it has significance. But you know what? When you finally figure out how to put it all together so that it creates that one image, collectively, the power of each of those pieces fitted together in the right order and operating in the right harmony and balance creates a beautiful and vivid picture. And that's what each and every aspect of our culture is like too. In and of itself, one thing has a lot of power. But if you combine it in the form and the fashion that the Creator gave us, showed us a way, said you use this language in a certain way, you use these instruments in a certain way, you dance in a certain way in this circle like that, and you put all these things together in a certain way, in a ceremonial way. Collectively then, all of, the, all of that spiritual power that's in each individual thing, it, it becomes a collective. And it starts rising out from the center of the circle. And it rises and it, it just emanates through our body. And when we're dancing in a circle as an entire community, Every member of your community is going in that circle together, singing in unison in your traditional language. That power rises up from the center of that circle, and it reaches out and touches you, and it blesses you, and it makes you strong, and collectively it makes your community strong. When we lost those ways, when we quit dancing, when we quit using our language, that's when things got bad for us. When we did not honor the gift of culture by keeping it going, that's when things went back for our communities. And the only way to go back to that is to get all the puzzle pieces together. And you know what? There's elders out there that know how to put that puzzle together. And you know what? I truly believe that if you don't know how, if you're sincere in your heart, and you pray to the Creator, you're going to be shown a way to put it together again. And I think the ancestors are going to look down and they're going to say, you know, our grandchildren down there, they're trying their best. And I believe those ancestors are going to make something happen. They're going to inspire a little one like Lark over here. They're going to inspire an elder, a young man singer, someone out there. They're going to inspire them. They're going to be like a protective spirit, guide them. Maybe when, the, when that child is starting to turn this way and head, head like this, that ancestor is going to gently guide him to go that way. And it would be a good way. As long as you believe, and as long as it's you got a good heart for it, I believe that's what's going to happen. Because that's what's happening in our community back home. In spite of all of our... Just like any community, you have problems between this family or that family or somebody doesn't like this person or somebody wants to be more important or get all the attention or they want to have more of this or that. That happens everywhere. But you know what? I truly believe that it's all comes together when you have a good and sincere desire. Now, Ooh, 45 minutes. Now, like I said, I'd rather talk with you than talk at you. So I'm going to stop for a moment and uh, ask if you all have any uh, comments, questions, concerns, or anything like that, anything that you want to share.
uh, before we continue this part. Um, when we were at Northern Southern, the words the, that we use, are they tense or are there not the, or excuse me, are there American or English words that you go along with the yeah. Yeah, It's question. easier to learn if we know what we're saying. Yeah. The question about, uh, for instance, in the stop dance songs. The stomp dances that the Delawares participate in now are, in a sense, a derivative, an adaptation of the old, uh, of the old longhouse or big house ceremonial dances, because the dance steps were very similar. You know, powwow way. You know, we're out there, got the big drum, really putting on those moves. But when we have our, you know, traditional Lenape dances. Our our steps are a bit more gentle, and with that way, when we lost some of our old ceremonial ways, or when, or when stomp dance became more and more uh, adopted by and adapted by the Delawares, it was because when they came to Oklahoma, the stomp dance began to uh, appear a bit more like the southeastern tribes too. Not, we did stop dance, but it was a bit different. Uh, the singers would use the rattles and they'd sit off to the side and they'd shake the rattle as they sang the songs to create the rhythm. The southeastern tribes, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, and others, uh, they they brought more of this uh, uh, current stomp dance way where the women are shaking the shells. And a lot of those songs came from those tribes. Many of the songs that we sing today, they're kind of a combination of chants and use of the traditional language. I know uh, because you use about four or five different songs during one lead, I have composed a song in Lenape to keep the rhythm going. And so, in some cases, it might be songs from another tribe. In some cases, it may be purely a chant. And when we get into the specifics of the song, I'll, I'll provide an example. Um, may we have permission to use that song? When we sing tonight? Anything I show, I leave with you. Anything I share with you tonight and tomorrow, I, I leave with you. Um, because once again, this is this. I'm not. First of all, it's not a religious ceremony. We're here to these are just purely social dance songs. And song dances. Let me tell you, I have been around those southeastern tribes, and I have, and I know the difference between a social dance kind of song dance. There's a lot of those real strict elders from those tribes uh, of the Southeast of the United States. They don't like uh, commercial stomp dances, they call them commercial, because they put out a flyer and they, they invite the general public and they they have a little table set up and they sell arts and crafts and, and everyone just gets together and has a good time. They still have their annual ceremonies where they take medicine, or they play stickball, or they, they have they carry out every year a certain ceremony that goes back hundreds of years. And that is a different, a little bit different. And those are the kinds of things that I don't, I don't have the permission to share with you. So, but yes, anything I, uh, that's why I'm here, to share it with you and ask you all to take care of it. And maybe you all will experience what we're experiencing back home. We've had a tremendous renaissance in tribal culture. And, and realization of tribal culture just in the last 12 years. We've got, now we've got lead singers and, and dancers and a generation of people from my generation who are taking the responsibility of being the keepers, of being the leaders, of being the teachers. Because the old timers now, they, they either don't want to lead anymore because they are too old and they don't want to take that responsibility or be honest with you, those, four, those folks 
they were, they were the victims of many of the social policies where they were told, no more, you can't, you can't do that anymore. And you know, when it's taken out of your mind as a 13-year-old girl or boy in Indian school, and now you're 67, 68 years old, it's kind of hard to remember how it went, what the word was, or it's hard to get that out of your, out of your psyche that any time you brought anything up in India as a kid, man, that, that taskmaster, that schoolmaster, they were going to punish you. They forbade you from doing it. So, I know a lot of old-timers that are like that. They, they have a respect, but they say, I don't know those ways anymore. I can't teach you, and I'm not going to get up and do it. You have my blessing if you want to go do it, but don't look to me to teach you, because I just can't do it. And we should not discriminate. We should not look at those elders and say, you failed your generation. Why did you, why did you let that way go and now you can't teach me? We should not do that to our elders. But if we can get their blessing, if, if they didn't carry it on, but they're giving us their blessing, we should ask for their prayers that we have the strength to take it inside us and, and take on that responsibility. And we as adults, we're the ones, folks, we're the ones in our generation, we're the ones. That's what's frightening. I was looking around, you know, and people in my community, I guess also because of my political leadership, um, you know, they were saying, you guys have got it now. And it's, it's pretty strong uh, responsibility to think that, wow, if I don't do my part, it will die out. And you know what? It's not going to die out on my watch. It's not going to happen in my generation, even if there's just one of them, even if it's me. But thank God there are so many in my generation who feel the same way. They need leadership. They need encouragement. They might be the second one out in that arena. They're a little too timid, or maybe they don't know enough to be the first one out there. But if that first person could get started, by golly, they'll be glad to jump out there and help out and learn. And that's what we're experiencing, and that's what I believe you all are already doing in some ways. But we're here this weekend maybe to start a little bit more, a little bit something new. Maybe that's not the right word, something new, because it's something ancient. But it hopefully will be a new introduction of songs and some dances. Uh, any other questions or comments as we roll it along here? I'm, I'm, Mark, I'm, at the same time, I would like Deepa or Chick. So that's how the, what the Delawares called the chicken when they were introduced to him. Deepas. Then along came the Dutch, and the Dutch whipped the Swedes, and the Dutch took over. What was it? Was it the Dutch and the sale of Manhattan Island and all of that? But the Dutch had a number of words that the Delawares borrowed from. And uh, for instance, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what the Dutch word is, and then I'll tell you what the Lenape word is, and what it means in today's contemporary English. The Dutch word, Apolit. And the Lenape word then is Apalish, meaning apple. The Delaware, I'm sorry, the Dutch word half anchor, A N K E R, which was a, a barrel. And so the Delaware word for barrel is Halpanko, or half anchor. They were trying to say it in the Dutch uh, language. And they would put, you know, because the Delawares, if you'll notice the Lenape language, they don't have that, uh, that R sound. Certainly no rolling R's like the Latin languages or anything. And so they, they uh, substitute with the L sound. And so, like I said, uh, the half anchor, uh, A-N-K-E-R, the Dutch word, uh, an anchor or anchor, uh, meaning barrel. And the Delaware word then was halpanko, or the word for a shirt or a dress made of uh, of a fiber product, 
the Dutch word was hemden, and the Lenape word is hempis, of course from hemp. Or the Dutch word for button is, uh, I guess it's pronounced in Dutch, knoop, K-N-O-O-P, knoop. And so the Delaware word, or Lenape word for button is knoop. Cucumber, the Dutch word is concomer. And so the Lenape word is skookemis. Uh Another Dutch word for a hammer or a maul is uh, moker. And so the Lenape word is moko. Paper, the Dutch word is uh, pampier. And the Delaware word then is pampio. And of course, uh, we know the Dutch word panakuk or panakuk in pancakes. And so the Delaware word is pankuk. Um, butter, butter in Lenape, butel. Eventually, the Dutch were whipped by the English, so the Delaware or Lenape began to borrow words from the English. Beer, beer, jacket, chicken, cherry, chalice, coffee, guppy, clock, kala, candy, kentis. Uh, then there was obviously words for things that they'd never seen before and became a bit more modern derivatives. Monkey, monkeys, automobile, automobile. Um, pepper, coffee, sugar, those kinds of things which they didn't have until they were imported from the Europeans became pepo, cuppy, um, shuko for sugar. How about this one? Whiskey. <laughs> wonder what that is. Tomato. So, uh, and then uh, as soon as the Lenape began to use the borrowed words as Lenape words, then they would compound them with true Lenape stems to create new words to describe new things that the Europeans had brought over. Now I use that word shuko for shuko. And I mentioned a word earlier, apom, bread. Shuko apom becomes a sugar bread or cake. And uh, a, a little ending on a lot of words is tut, tut. It means small or little one. So shuko apom tut. Small, sugar, bear, a bear, bread, sugar, bear, a cake. Small, sugar, bread, a cookie. So, again, the, the Lenape borrowed words um, and developed them into their, into their lexicon. Um, this one was kind of interesting in some notes I had. Uh, Many Lenape place names are still found throughout the eastern United States. Here I am coming to New Jersey to tell you all about that. And you may already know, but here's some examples. Um, Alloway, New Jersey, or we have an Alloway spelled a little bit different in Oklahoma. But the, the, in Lenape, the uh, Alloway means more. Hoboken, New Jersey. Hoboken pipe, a tobacco pipe. Manati for Manhattan Island, the place that is an island. Uh, Paseo, Paseo, New Jersey, Valley. Uh, Tamahikan, or Tomahawk, a week long, uh, week long, or house. <coughs> Lenhoxana, moccasins. These are particularly Lenape moccasins in their construction. These are my ceremonial moccasins with my clan symbol turtle on there. Um, so 
It's a complex, difficult language. There's a lot of that. A lot of that work in this. And so I have to take extra time to be precise and stop for a moment before I prepare. <coughs> Usually I've got to get a bit of spit in my mouth so that I can, you know, get that good sound going there. Um, but anyway, you know, I could talk a lot about language and I, I hope to. I just want to encourage you. Pick up, even if, even if you just say, this month I'm going to learn Three words. Just three words you use in the language. Use those three words every day. Even if it's one issue or thank you. Even if it's a hey, hey. That's a simple one. It means yes. Ku means no. Just little responses like this. Every time you have a community feed, somebody's going to make fry bread, don't call it fry bread. Everyone loves to use that word. It sounds so Indian. It's so cool, fry bread. Start calling it salapapa, fried bread. Lanapi. And when you start saying that around other Indians, I want some. I want some fry bread. Salapa. Yeah. Start using that all the time. I'd really like to encourage you to do that. Well, listen, it's, uh, it's going on 7 o'clock, and we want to uh, enjoy some of our dance now. I think uh, the sun is beginning. You can really tell that the seasons are changing, right? We have a beautiful full moon. I was actually in Manhattan two nights ago uh, in New York, and uh, I was uh, walking around Times Square of all places. But I looked up and saw that full moon, and it was pretty. It sure was pretty. And... Uh, I can sense this change of the seasons. I think we officially hit that um, uh, time when we're going to go from summer to the autumn season. That's just coming up uh, in about a week on the calendar uh, by the phases of the moon and, and uh, the way the sun rises and sets. It's, it's happening. And it's an exciting time. It's a powerful time. And it's a time, too, when a lot of our dances occur in celebration of this particular time. The continuing of the circle. The circle of the seasons. As expressed in these little teaching books like this. Each season has a significance in and of itself. But it's all connected. And talking about that circle and its interconnectedness. Before we begin to talk about these songs and pick up these instruments and start learning, you all know this. Most of you all have been in the circle. Most of you all have danced. Most of you all know about the, the spiritual nature of our songs and our dances and what it means to our culture. Yes, we're going to learn social dances. We're just going to have some good old-fashioned fun. But it, too, can honor the ancestors. It, too, can bring about a good spirit that blesses the people. From a ceremonial standpoint, in addition to powwow, social dances, and that kind of thing, from a ceremonial standpoint, when we talk about the dance, and we talk to other cultures, and we share with other cultures, why do you do that, they say? Well, in non-Indian cultures, you know, dancing is, you know, that's entertaining. <laughs> Right? You got it. Why do you dance? Well, dance to have fun, right? Yes. But it's more than that, because as I go back to the dance as a gift from the Creator, a way of creating that harmony by bringing all the people together in one circle and traveling in one direction and creating a spiritual energy by putting all of these elements together in a certain form or fashion. Putting together the jigsaw puzzle so that you are illuminating with the view of the entire big picture. And so, I listen to what elders say about why we dance. And they tell me this. And think about this in terms of the circle. We dance to pray. We pray to heal. We heal to live. And we live to dance. And if 
you embrace that and honor the ancestors with that thought as you approach the dance, especially the ceremonial ones. But really, every time you get in that circle, even if it's the social dances, you honor the ancestors by carrying on those dances. You say a little prayer. Maybe just step outside the circle or step right in the middle of that circle. Especially those who are given the responsibility of preparing a fire. Even if it's for the social dances, when you prepare that fire, if, if one of your young men in your community is given that responsibility, prepare that fire for us, young brother. When you do that, I'm going to use you as an example. Forgive me for pointing at you like this. But I'm, let's say, because that's what we do. We, we, we picked a couple of young men. And we gave them that responsibility. When we have our dances, you young men, you're going to be responsible for making that fire. And when you go out and you collect that firewood, think up here what you're doing. You're taking those, those gifts from the Creator. And whatever form was put out there, Creator also knew that that is to be used in a certain way. And so if you're selected as that fire keeper and you go out and you collect your firewood, that man's got that tobacco. Take you a little pocket full. And when you're walking around collecting firewood, maybe you stand on the edge of that woods and you stop for a moment. You say a prayer to the Creator. Creator, I've been given this responsibility. I'm going to collect firewood. I'm going to build a fire in that, in that circle, that dance circle, that special place where my people are going to come together. My own relatives, my own parents and grandparents, they're going to come together and they're going to celebrate this beautiful gift of culture. Creator, bless me as I touch these grandfathers here. As I bring them all together, I ask you to bless me so that what I do when I prepare this fire for the people, it's going to be a good fire. The spirit in that fire is going to come out. It's going to, it's going to come out when those songs are being sung. It's going to, it's going to, the fire's going to, going to happen. I'm not going to have to, to labor real hard. Creator, help me out. And you're not going to need to take a can of charcoal lighter fluid soak some big log down and throw a match on it and say, that's a ceremonial, a ceremonial fire. Because if you, I've been taught, and I've tried to pass along to our young men, if you take that attitude, that fire is going to come. It's going to come up in a good and natural way. But the spirit that's in that is going to be drawn out by the dance steps of the people, by the prayers of those who create the fire, by the prayers that are expressed through the songs and the dance, by the, those that dance around that fire. And that special spirit that's in that fire, that grandfather, Kahunsa, our grandfather fire, that spirit's going to come out. And again, as part of that powerful circle, that rhythm, that harmony, that balance that's going in that circle, All the spirit and those different things are going to come together. And collectively, it's going to reach out. It's going to touch you here. It's going to touch you here. It's going to, it's going to make your legs stronger. It's going to make your heart beat faster. It's going to make your eyes clearer. It's going to make your hearing a little bit better. It's going to make your senses more acute. That's the power of that. That's what I'm talking about when we pray in our songs, in our dance steps. We're not praying to that fire. That fire is not God. That fire is a grandpa, a, a grandfather, an elder, given to us by our Creator. Comes out, helps us out. That's why I'm saying we dance to pray. We pray to heal. We heal to live. We live to dance. So, again, I'm not. Please forgive my tone at times. I get passionate about this because it gives me strength when I share this. But I, I don't mean to address you all in any sort of a preaching way like this. I, I mean to, to share it in a respectful way. And I hope maybe... And many of you all I know already know these things. But it's important that I share my perspective as I try to bring these songs forward. 
as I try to bring these dance steps forward because I want you to know how important it is to me and the approach that I take um, before I dare stand before you and, and share it in this way. Um, so, uh, I'll tell you what, let me run and get a quick drink of water. The next thing I think we're going to do, well, first of all, are there any other comments or questions from, from anyone on <laughs> they don't have sassafras in Oklahoma. Hmm. <laughs> we do. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, were there any comments or questions? If not, I think what we'll do is Malaksikan, bean dance. Let me see what the spring planting book says about the bean. Well, this is about gourds. Oh, yeah, this book is about gourds. Growing gourds in a garden. Yeah, okay. Well, Many of you all know about that bean vine and about the bean being one of the great three sisters, corn beans and squash, right? The foodstuffs that, you know, that nourished our people for thousands of years. That saved a lot of Europeans when they came over to this continent and created a now an incredible worldwide industry and has saved other continents. But we, we know them as sisters. Take care of us in that good way. The bean dance. When we dance and we, when, when we follow that bean dance step, the, you, you dance in a single file and you start making these movements around the dance arena. There's no going in a circle in this case. You're, what you're doing is you're, you're you're emulating, you're, you're showing how that bean vine, when it grows, you know how it does, it just, you know, it just kind of takes off in different directions and snakes around and comes like this, you know, kind of follows its own path. L likes to get close to those corn stalks, you know, so they got something to kind of wrap around a little bit, you know, stay in shape. And so there are a series of seven songs in the Lenape bean dance, Malaksitka. And there are a lot of derivatives in the Lenape language. Now, if you don't understand something that I say or you need it repeated, here's another Lenape word said all the time. Keku? What? What? Keku? Keku Hodge? It's a question, you know, you're... So, Keku, if, if, I, if there's something I don't say just right or you didn't get it, you want me to repeat it. Keku, just sound off. Malaksika, uh, the bean dance. Malaksike, he does the bean dance. Malaksikata, let's all do the bean dance. Um, there are a lot of, uh, of, of derivatives here. Um, we've got uh, Maui, I want to go to a dance. Maui ta. Now remember, I said, Gata Maui, I want to go to a dance. And then you take that Maui, Maui ta. Let's, let us go to a dance. So, uh, there are, you know, derivatives here, but uh, there's so much to learn. I don't, I'm not, I'm trying not to get into teaching you all the language. I just wanted you to hear some of these words. Um, the next thing I should do is, I guess, let's put in a tape of the bean dance and listen to the songs. 
We'll listen to the seven songs first. Each song is probably about 30 or 40 seconds. And then we'll... Uh, then I'll sing along with the bean dance. And then I want to, you to introduce me to the singers who are, we're going to give the responsibility of learning the dance. So, can we... Well, you need another simple Well, that's for you. Yeah, we'll I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to get this up on the stage. Generally, the way it's, it's, uh, it's done is the one leader is the only one with the rap. And everyone follows behind, but everyone can sing. Once they learn the songs, everyone can sing together. Can it be any battle? Can it be any other battles that you've done? Now, back home, we use this gourd rattle uh, for many different. These gourds now um, we use in uh, gourd dancing for the veterans. Uh, in our Native American church, we use one that's a little bit smaller. And uh, I've seen a lot of Cherokees and Creeks use these. And, you know, in our old big house church, we used this. Uh, instead of a handle like this, though, it was uh, like a leather thong that we would slide our fingers over this and shake that. Like this in the old church. Now, I think what I'll do is I'll also set this up on the microphone. Justine. And then when we dance, it's set up man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. And all holding hands together to create the bean bond. And so when we dance, when we get going, we'll start doing this. So, at a certain point, like I said, let's listen to the tape, to the songs, the whole, the seven songs first on tape. Then I will sing along. Then I want you to bring your singers forward. Looking at the words, we'll practice a run through, and then the best practice is we'll all get together and start dancing. And I'll take the lead on the first one. Starts off with the rattle and five times. Yo, Gina. Call everyone together. Oh, 
song ends by saying, oh, oh. What's the Delaware song do? Oh, 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 oh,
and it, it, does, it sounds like it should be make a difference. Nay, yay, hey. But there actually is, there's a meaning. I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a meaning to the way the song is sung, although it is in a chant form. Now, a lot of our Indian songs oftentimes are in a chant form. We use a very common uh, vocabulary of chants. Oh yeah, nay, 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 all of those kinds of sounds and developing a rhythmic pattern. I'm not good at composing music, and I don't know about how music is composed, but I just have found that when you break it down line by line, and when you start seeing a pattern in there, it makes it easier to learn. So, um, you fellows who have been uh, uh, looking at these words, uh, I encourage you to try one more round. Those of you who have not danced yet, those of you who have not danced yet, I want to encourage you to take one more beat dance. And remember what it is that we're doing, what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and please go with me as I say that I'm more of a student than a teacher. What I'm trying to do is, in my movements, I'm trying to honor that beat line and the way it grows in my dance movement. So as the dance leaders, when it comes time to and it's a little easier out in the arena than when you're in a room full of tables. When you're out in the arena, because you've got all kinds of room to kind of snake around and pull those little fancy moves like I did. Did you notice how I was doing that? You did going round and round and round into a real tight circle like this. And then all of a sudden you turn and you start going the opposite way and lead the same way out. Like this. And pretty soon you got people crisscrossing like that. I'm telling you, when you've got about 50 people dancing, it's really fun because it gets kind of dizzy. But that's what this is about. It's a social dance. It's for fun. Now, how about the kids? Lark and all the kids. All right. If we do the bean dance, will you dance with us? Because this, again, this is meant to have fun. All right, for our, for our three singers, I'm going to put, we've got some more. We've got some more rounds. If there's anyone else who would like to uh, come up and sing, now I, it's up to your, Mark, it's up to your community to determine if they want to uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know how to say this, divert.